Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for tuning in. Um, uh, this is Hyro from Wellness for Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to Kendall Rusing. She is a uh, seven-time world champ. Um, we also have on the call today a psychotherapist who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, hypnotherapist. And for the last 24 years, she's had a specialty in eating disorders. She's also a clinical director at Growth and Healing Wellness Center in Coral Gable, or no, Coral Springs, right, Margie? It's in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale. actually. I live in Coral Springs. <laughs> okay, sorry. It's <laughs> okay. So Kendall, what's going on? I'm super excited to be here, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to get the message out there and just kind of have a good conversation today. So thank you guys for taking the time. So I kind of looked you up and I saw your resume <laughs> and wow, you've, you're like no joke. You've been, uh, you've been at you. it for a little while. Thank so you. Yeah, one thing. One thing I always like to clarify, really, quick, because I know I know it's a seven-time world champion, but something that's a little bit controversial in the jiu-jitsu world. Um, I'm a two-time black belt world champion, and then the other championships were at different belts. So I I just don't want to like have it be misleading. I'm a new black belt. I'm at the top of the level now. I've won the I won double gold at the Nogi Worlds, um, but the other the other world championships were at different belts. So I always like to kind of like clarify that in the beginning so people don't get upset. <laughs> yeah, you were uh... my whole life. Yeah, according to what I looked up, you 2019 was no gi. You uh, you've won second at the UAE Grand Slam, the SJJIF. You won that as well mm -hmm. last year as well. Yeah. Um, so well, when did you start? Like when did you start jujitsu? Um, I started jujitsu when I was five, but that was just because my dad loved jujitsu. My parents actually moved from Atlanta, Georgia to California to chase jujitsu back in the 90s because at the time there weren't really any jujitsu schools anywhere else other than California for the most part um, because they came from Brazil and they they loved California. They liked the surf life, the acai bowl life. Um, so they moved here and I started when I was five and then I kept training and competing and I started judo when I was seven um, and then just to fast forward, I was competing all the time and training and I loved it. Um, and one of the things I always say is that like people always ask me how I've competed and trained so long. And really it was just cause my parent was never my parents idea. They never forced me to do anything. If I wanted to take a day off, I could take a day off. Um, the competing was always my idea. So I always like to put a plug in for that because then when I was 12, uh, 13, actually I switched completely to wrestling. So then I was wrestling in high school. Um, I wrestled for Team USA. I traveled a lot internationally for Team USA. Um, I wrestled a year in college at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. And then uh, that was kind of, we'll get more into this later, but that was like the height of my eating disorder. Then I came back um, to California and I started jiu-jitsu again and I decided not to go back to school, which was crazy for me because that was on the Olympic track and that was the goal. That was the plan um, with Team USA. And I was, you know, kind of had my sights set on 2020 and well, well, who knew this was going to happen now? They're not even until 2021. But at the time I, I was on the track, the Olympic track for 2020 and that didn't happen. And I made the decision to come back and I started jujitsu again when I was, I want to say 18, I have to double check, but I think 18, I'm 22 now, uh, maybe 19. Yeah. So I've been doing jujitsu again for the last just about three years and um, yeah, so, so that's, but, but the reason I brought up the parents thing is when I switched to wrestling, like they owned jiu-jitsu schools. They just, it was their whole life and that was their business. And they took, they let me just kind of do my own thing and do whatever I wanted and supported my dream and paid thousands of dollars for me to travel all around the world competing um, only to have me come back to jiu-jitsu in the end. Cause a lot of times parents ask me like, Oh, well, how do I keep him interested? I'm like, let him do other stuff, you know? <laughs> and then look at me now jiu-jitsu is my entire life. How could my parents have planned that? They didn't plan it. They just let me do what I wanted. And I naturally ended up back here. So anyway, I just wanted to plug that in real quick. Cause it's a huge part of things for me okay which uh do you i'm assuming that which do you prefer gi or no gi oh man i this question is always funny because i love both and whenever i focus on one primarily i start missing the other but as far as like my competition results i've done better no gi which is uh probably partially in part to my uh, wrestling career my wrestling background um but i'm learning to get a lot more technical in the gi so i, I enjoy both of them yeah, I had the I had the same I had the same issue too as well because I, I I wrestled I actually you you placed first I placed second well it was a long time ago obviously there's a large age age gap between you and I but I placed second in California I went to high school out oh wow yeah. it's a big deal even to go to the state tournament in California like it's yeah. a huge deal. like you're in a, you're a I rock lost star. This, I lost to the same guy twice oh. they, <laughs> the uh, 
he was, I remember it is ingrained in my life with my brain forever. Oh my god! Like he, he embarrassed me the first the first round, and I won the second round. He lost the second round, and then I had to compete against him the third round, and I lost him like in overtime. I like won. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. And it was just like for the rest of my life, I'm scarred. But did you grow up here? Uh, kind of. I went to high school out in California. Before okay. that, I was in Washington State, and then and then I was I grew up as a kid here in Miami. Okay. Back as an adult, yeah. Um, so, what's your daily regimen like, as far as working out? Like, like what do you what do you do? Like, in other words, is it strictly jujitsu? Is it what do you do? Like a, a combination of stuff? What what is yeah. it? Yeah. So, I mean, well, right now is a little funky because it's the coronavirus, so things are a little bit changed. But uh, but it's, it's not too different. Uh, my daily my daily regimen, honestly, uh, I used to, and this is a huge topic in jiu-jitsu, I used to over, well, I'm mean, that's a controversial term. I used to train a lot, probably more than I should to the point where my body was broken down all the time and my competition results were kind of, um, were kind of showing that I was training too much. And so now I do, I only do like a, re- like a really, really hard training session, like once or twice a week, like once or twice a week that's it like a really tough like two hours one and a half hour to two hour a lot of sparring every round's a hard round with really incredible partners um i do that one to do one to two days a week so my normal day that doesn't include that will look like in the morning um i'm drilling and i do and i drill techniques for you know about an hour um with my partner and so 30 minutes is like the time that is for me um so that I try to do three days a week in the morning. The other two days a week in the morning, I'm lifting, I'm doing strength and conditioning. And then in the afternoon, I teach, I teach full time. So I start teaching at three, I teach all night and then I train at night. So for example, like this is not always how it goes, but just as an example, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday would look like me, uh, Well, Monday, Friday would be drilling in the morning. Tuesday, Thursday would be strength and conditioning in the morning. And then those nights I train pretty hard with my team, but it's, uh, it's with our students. So it's not like an hour and a half of sparring. It's like, I do the class with them and I teach and then I I do, you know, maybe 30 to 40 minutes of sparring with them at the end of the class. And then Wednesday I have like an super intense training session in the morning, which is like one and a half to two hours of basically all sparring, like hard sparring with some of the toughest people around, um, including Anna Laura, who's an ADCC champion, multiple time black belt world champion. And I trained with her or Octavio Souza, who's in Huntington beach. Sometimes we go see him in the morning, um, a three time black belt world champion. So that's tough. And then in the evening, I'll usually take the night off with my students and kind of just teach. And, uh, as you guys probably know, teaching is, is pretty taxing on the body and on the mind, uh, especially when you're teaching straight from like three to nine and with kids and all that crazy stuff. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of my normal schedule for the week. And then Saturday I teach in the morning and then I kind of leave it up to how my body feels. I might do some light training, but I usually don't do anything too crazy. Uh, the only thing that changed with coronavirus is since I haven't had as much sparring, I do live with my boyfriend who's a black belt. So luckily he and I can spar together a lot, which is great. Um, and, and we're great training partners. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and we're great training partners, uh, I, which is a whole other topic, but I think that it's really tough to find training partners, especially when it's like a man and a woman, especially with a relationship and then all that wrapped up. But we do a really good job where he, you know, pushes me to my limits, but doesn't like, uh, go over the top and like, you know, beat me up and make me feel uncomfortable or anything like that. So we're great training partners. And he would, is kind of like my premier, my primary coach, I would say, as far as like technical stuff and my technique advice. And then, um, the only thing that's changed with coronavirus is I've been doing a little more cardio as far as like sprints go. Um, just because my strength and conditioning coach is having me do that because I'm not getting as much cardiovascular activity with the sparring just cause it's a smaller amount. So yeah. And that was a lot, but I hope that answers. And then I also do like with my strength and conditioning coach, she'll give me like mobility or foam rolling or stuff to do as like homework. And I'll do that on my own time throughout the week as needed. Yeah. I've always wondered that it's since uh, like, obviously I'm not a woman. Like, so I, it's one of those things where I feel like it's uh, cause you were talking about training partners. I've noticed from my perspective as a guy, is it that you have to be like invited into the fold for in into like the 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 woman the woman dynamic in other words they have to be the, the average woman and there's one brown belt that i used to train with in fight sports she told me that she's like uh maggie no not maggie 
My, oh. my dad used to play that. No, <laughs> uh, I've actually rolled with her. She's uh, <laughs> she's, she's awesome. Much strong. She's much stronger once. than what she looks. Oh, she's super strong. We competed once at Purple Belt, but we haven't competed again since. We competed. We fought at the World Pro in Abu Dhabi uh, at Press Purple Belt. So that was crazy. <laughs> And I won that match, but we haven't fought again since. And I know she's she's done a lot better. So I, I we're friends, but I know it's it's inevitable. So I look forward to it. She's amazing. Yeah. So one of the things that she told me is that a lot of the women have to be picky who they roll with when it comes to men, which I can completely understand. Uh, so it's like, like explain a little bit because I'm I'm a, like I kind of want the guys that are watching this to understand like the perspective from a woman of what it's like to be in a jujitsu gym from a woman's oh, yeah. perspective. Yeah, um, I, I really respect that, that she told you that because to be honest, like as far as like being picky with partners, I think it's a really big insecurity of us women because, so let me see my copy down. Here's, here's the thing, <laughs> like to be accepted in jujitsu in general, we feel, uh, well, not anymore, but a lot of times we feel very uncomfortable because we're in, a, we're in a male environment, a male dominated environment. A lot of times we're made to seem as like the girl, like training with the girls, like the rest round, or like, she's not as strong or she's not as technical or whatever. Then it's also like, you're not really a part of because you can't like have like locker room talk, like with the guys, like they do like that whole thing. Um, and like, you're not taking us seriously because even now, like winning a tournament, like I literally remember in wrestling, which is different because it's wrestling, but it's similar. Like, like when I won the state, like the guys would be like, yeah, but you won like girl state, like, you know, like it's not as hard. So, so there's that. Right. So then there's what this girl was talking about with being picky with partners. So how do you go from the insecurity to then making demands? Right. So that's kind of where I've had a tough battle with that as well, especially being a bigger woman. I'm like 180, 185, just depending. And so for me, I don't even have that situation where I'm like really small, like 120 or 115, where I could really get hurt. Of course, it still applies, but not in the same extreme. So then for me and being my professor's daughter, like my dad's my instructor, so people think I'm going to be like, you know, incredible. Then I have these credentials of winning tournaments. So then it's like, there's no excuse because I'm like supposed to be some superstar. Right. So, so with that, and then having the insecurity of not fitting in or not being good enough, where do you start making decisions for yourself in your training that are smart to keep your body safe? And how do you start doing those things in a way that's respectful, that you um, are not going to hurt people's feelings, but also you're taking care of yourself? And how do you lay out those boundaries? Um, so for the men listening, I think it's like, if a woman is going to roll with you, uh, number one, know that, you know, she's tough and, and she can roll and she can train hard. Yes, there's that aspect of it. But it's also a very important exercise in trust. Because especially if you're going with someone who's smaller, you have a lot of strength or, or technical advantage or anything like that. She's trusting that you're not going to abuse that um, while also not, you know, patronizing her and treating her like she's a child. So it is a hard balance. And I do respect where men come from with this because sometimes like, like I, I try to think about it from that perspective and kind of put myself in those shoes. And it's hard to know, like, do you just go with them? Like they're a man. Do you treat them like they're, you know, a 12 year old girl and barely even do anything. Do you kind of go somewhere in the middle? And I think it comes with a lot of practice, but I think the number one thing to, to realize is that they're just a human being, you know, it's just a human being. Like if you're going with a man, do you want to outmuscle them so much that you hurt their shoulder? Probably not. So you probably don't want to do the same thing with a woman either. But I think the ego gets into play there where it's like, oh man, I don't want this girl to pass my guard. I'm going to go, you know, crazy and try to crank her neck down and break her posture because I can't see, I can't have my professor seeing a girl pass my guard. That's embarrassing, you know? <laughs> and, and as much as I understand that, I think that's really where this all stems from. And we have to let that go. If we let that go, then women no, no longer will have the issue of like, oh, I, I have to be careful who I roll with but that's you know asking all of society to make a change overnight which is probably not a realistic uh, ask right so that's kind of where I come from with that yeah, but, yeah, I, I, but I yeah go ahead Margie well yeah I was, I was just gonna say like or uh I'll do one more one more sentence on this and then I'll let you guys go like uh the one last thing is like treat them like they're like just to reiterate like treat them like they're a human being treat them with kindness respect and trust and for the women out there listening like 
it's okay to say no. It's okay to say, I don't feel like rolling this round. It's okay to like not train with a certain person if you don't really trust how they're going to treat you. Because I've definitely had experiences where I didn't think I should roll with someone because I know I, they've done something to me in the past or I've seen how they roll. They're a little spazzy or whatever it is. And then I rolled with them anyway and I got hurt and I should have said no. And I should have respected myself and drawn a boundary, but I was worried about, you know, being seen as like a bitch. So yeah, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> it's, it's, I feel like it's the, the, the same conceptually the same as if like a like the way the upper belt kind of looks at the the lower belt like hey man you got to kind of be cautious of who you pick to roll with because for a guy too and I'm not the smallest guy I'm 200 pounds you know I've rolled with some guys that are high level guys that are 240 pounds and very athletic where I was like yeah you're scary dude like you're you're yeah. jumping over my guard trying to snatch my arm in a Kimura while you're landing at 240 pounds, it, it freaks you out. So I, I they, like sometimes in, from my perspective, I, I look at some of the women, I'm like, I can imagine what they feel. You know, like you said, you're not the, you're not the, like a normal tiny girl, but when the woman is like, you know, 130, 140, 150 right. pounds and you're 200 pounds, of course, you're going to have a little bit of hesitation. So you got to kind of expect that a little bit. Um, yeah. So what, what, um, Let's kind of go into the the diet part. You've talked about the training. Like, what do you do for, for how do you do your food now? Now that you're, that yeah. you're like, a, do you cycle your food? Do you periodize your stuff? How do you do your food? Man, um, for me, and, and obviously maybe this is not the best for everyone for me because I have uh, eating disorders in my, in my system or in my past, or I have an addictive personality, however you want to describe it. Um, for me, the solution has been, to be very relaxed with my food um, because if I start to, you know, like I, for me, I consider myself like I don't have the luxury of like doing a juice cleanse or doing intermittent fasting or doing any of those things that are very popular or people think are, are special or for some reason, because if I do that, I start to get crazy. Like I start to get like, I start to think about my food too much and then I overthink it. And then I like it, it just, it's just bad. So for me, I eat a primarily plant-based diet. Um, I eat a lot of plant foods. Um, I do have eggs and fish sometimes, depending on how I'm feeling, or I'll have cheese sometimes. I, again, I don't make it like a strict thing because I don't want to get obsessive over it, but I know I feel best when I eat mostly plant-based foods, so I definitely don't eat any meat. And then sometimes I eat eggs, uh, eggs fish, or cheese. Um, or if it's like, you know, something that's baked, I don't really look into see if it has eggs in it. But I do eat mostly plants, like mostly a plant-based diet. Uh, if I do have those things, it's usually not more than once a day. Um, and then the way that it's structured is for me, this is another kind of an eating disorder thing. I need to make sure that I eat within two hours of being awake uh, because I know that if I wake up and I drink coffee and I'm kind of hyper and I'm like, I get like high off the coffee and not eating, right? So I'm like going, 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 working, working, working. Um, and I think I'm too busy to eat or I'm doing X, Y, and Z, or I go work out and I'm like, I'm not even hungry. I don't feel hungry. For me, it doesn't matter if I feel hungry or not. I eat within two hours of being awake um, because I know if I don't, it's going to show up on my plate later. And I'm, then I'm going to have like feelings of guilt about it. Cause I'm going to be starving at night or in the afternoon. Um, or maybe it won't even show up till the next day. But for me, I eat within two hours of waking up, no matter what activity I'm going to be doing that day. Um, and I eat a lot of fresh food, a lot of fruit, a lot of vegetables, um, a lot of nuts, stuff like that. And then, um, normally I'll eat like something kind of small in the morning just cause I, I usually train right away. So I don't want to have a full stomach and then I'll eat, you know, another meal, right after training that's like not super big and then after the next few hours I'll have like kind of like a lunch that's like medium sized uh I usually have like a smoothie or a snack later in the afternoon and then I have like a dinner so I usually like five times a day um but it's not super strict and then like I don't eat uh, dessert all the time, but like last night I had like a pint of Ben and Jerry's because that's what I was feeling and that was cool for me. And I know that if I do that periodically, then it saves me from obsessing over it all the time, from feeling guilty. Um, and then, you know, from like snacking on dessert all week throughout the week. If I just do it when I feel like it, then I kind of get over it and move on, you know? So um, like I said, it's not super strict. It's not like some specific plan, um, but that's what works for me. And especially because I can fit it into my lifestyle and I fit my my lifestyle or I fit my food into my lifestyle I don't revolve my lifestyle around my food and that's something that's way different than it used to be so that's huge for me yeah but how, how did you make that shift was it because of the issue that you had because that's a that's a great way of, of looking at it you know you've uh, oh yeah because even even myself as well as 
is I used to have the same issue with like eating like kind of bad food. And now I just eat it guilt free. If I'm going to have it, I just have it. And then it, it basically, it, it, uh, kills this because this is what really is the problem it's not i don't think it's the actual food it's you start getting into this hamster wheel over and over again and you kind of let that right. go um, yeah or it, with the bad food it's a balance and, and i'm sure margie might want to jump in here too i see her nodding her head a lot she has a lot of knowledge here yeah. um <laughs> she, she knows all about this but i i think like with the bad food for me there's a balance right because there may be a week where I feel like eating a pint of Ben and Jerry's every day during that week. I don't know. That's probably not necessarily super healthy for me, but even on those weeks, I let it happen because I just need to let it go. And the second I try to rein it in and get, get really obsessive about it or get like really like feeling guilty about it, then it'll turn into two weeks. You know what I'm saying? So I let it happen as long as it's going to happen for me with my history. That's what's best because then I'll probably go for three weeks without ever even touching it because I just don't care. Um, so it's, but it was really hard to do that because like to answer your question about, you know, where did that stem from? Like, I was so terrified of gaining weight. I didn't think like the mental, the mental results of, of healing were going to be worth it because I was going to go up so high in weight. And I did, and I did gain weight when I first got recovered, like quite a bit, actually. Like, I think the highest I got up to was probably about 215. And I still looked really athletic just because I'm tall and I carry weight well. Um, and I'm about 185 now. But it wasn't until I healed like my mind and the way that I structured eating and thought about food and that the weight fell off. It wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to lose weight and then I'm going to be happy. I was like, no, I have to be happy in the body I'm in and then the weight will take care of itself. Um, but Margie, do you want to you want to add anything? Yes. Jump- <laughs> I, I have so much I can say. Um, I don't know where... I'll just start and then you guys can ask me whatever you want to ask me. But yeah, um, I think it's really awesome. First of all, the journey you've been on and how far you've come because it's so difficult to deal with an eating disorder to begin with in the quote unquote real world. But then when you're an athlete, it's so difficult because that's your life and you're in it every day. And, you know, and I do look at eating disorders like addiction. So I'm glad that you see it the same way. So it's probably the hardest addiction because you can't just quit eating, right? Like you can quit a drug, right? Or you can quit drinking. You can't be like, I'm just not gonna eat anymore. So it's something you have to live with every day. And that's why it's so difficult, but um, it sounds like you've made really great progress. So I think first, just for people to know, like when you wake up and eating within two hours, no matter how you feel is really great because yeah, it sets off your metabolism, it sets off, just kind of like sets you off in a balanced way for the day. So I love a lot of things that you said. Um, First, starting your day off like that. And also when you're not starting it off that way, how things just kind of like bottle up. And yeah, that sets you up for, and, and listen, not everybody has an eating disorder. Some people have disordered eating, right? Or emotional eating, or they're on their way to that. Like it could escalate to that or you can dip into it and then out of it, but um, it doesn't always have to be bulimia or anorexia. It could be something that hasn't been diagnosed, but you just know like you're thinking, like you guys were saying, like your thinking is not aligned, right? You know, your thinking is revolving around food and it's not the other way around. Like you said, where now food is part of your life, but your life doesn't revolve around the food anymore. So when it escalates and it bottles up like that, then yeah, you're setting yourself up to binge. You're setting yourself up to withhold food or do something that is disordered in some way, right? So it doesn't support you. So I always tell clients, yeah, eat every few hours. At the beginning, you're so out of alignment with your body. You don't even know when you're hungry and your signals are crisscrossed, right? So you have to set it up where you're just eating no matter how you feel every two hours. Set up the meals that you love. I don't believe in eating meals that you think you're supposed to be eating. Like people get into the habit of like the dry chicken that tastes disgusting (laughs) and that just has like salt on it and that's it and salad, you know, and and that's a lot of people's go-to. That's not necessarily the healthiest thing. And if you're not loving what you're eating, you're not going to enjoy it. And I believe if you're not enjoying it, you're not going to stick to it. And then that turns into so many other negative things inside of you. So, so definitely set up the foods that you love, break it up into 
yeah, every few hours until you start to listen to your body and know, okay, I trained extra hard today. So maybe I need extra fuel before or after, right? And you kind of learn like on those days I train harder, I need more food or I need more protein or I need more carbs or I need certain kinds of foods. But until you're able to listen to your body, I think it's great to work with a therapist, work with a nutritionist and just kind of get aligned with like mentally, how do I get okay with just my daily regimen and what I'm doing. And the other thing I wanna say is a lot of times we eat emotionally. So you're upset and you go eat junk food. You're upset at yourself about how much you ate, so then you withhold. And you can go up and down like that with the emotions. So, you know, when you let your emotions tell you what to eat, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> so setting up a regimen at the beginning is really great because then you don't have to think about it. You know, like I tell women, it's like having that little black dress in your closet. It's like your go-to, you can just grab or having like your go-to outfits where you don't have to think about it, just grab them. It's like that with food. It's like you have your five to 10 meals that are your favorite, go to those when you don't know what else to do and just, and the snacks and eat those. But I think, I mean, you can tell me from your perspective, but I think it's so helpful, right, to have a regiment like that at the beginning when you're not clear on what you're supposed to be doing and not letting your emotions take over. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree um, with with that because with the emotional eating, like you're saying, like you, you withhold because you want to, whatever your goal is, like you want to be skinny or lose weight, so you withhold then you overeat because your body's like, uh, I need food and I'm starving. And then you overeat. And then you're depressed about how much you ate. So then you withhold again. And it's just, and then you eat more because you're depressed. It's just like a vicious cycle. So I agree with having, even now, like I have, like, for example, like, I've been posting on my Instagram story. I have like one meal that I've been going to right now when I'm like super in a rush and I don't have time. And it's like Kashi, like whole grain cereal with cashew milk, uh, bananas or blueberries, hemp hearts, chia seeds, and cinnamon, just because I know it has like all the things that I need. And and I can get it quickly. And I've been posting that like all the time. So even now, like, like even after, you know, four years into, to this journey, um, I still do that all the time and I'll go through phase. Like I'll do this probably for a few months and then it'll be another thing in a few months, but I get something that I really love and I enjoy and I'm like, Oh, that's so good. And I know it feels really good when I eat it and I, and I feel energized. Um, and I know I can go to it all the time and I keep those things stocked up in my house. So, so it definitely works well for me. And, and I think in the beginning too, uh, like I was kind of mentioning on before we jumped on this call, a lot of my recovery has, uh, come from a 12-step program um, around eating disorders and, and having people um, who have been through this and walked through the steps that I needed to walk through kind of guide me in those directions and kind of say like, I know you're not hungry, but you need to eat. It's been four hours. Hey, like, you know, those kind of things is like, because because you're right, like the, the sensors are off, you know, in the beginning, the <laughs> sensors are off. And not only are the sensors are off, but we're over hypercritical of, you know, body image and gaining weight and so concerned with those things that it's like, I'm not sure if I'm hungry. And since I'm not hungry, I'm just not going to eat because I also don't want to gain weight. It's like a double, It's it, it just keeps piling on you know it keeps piling on over and over um so having a strict not i guess i wouldn't say strict having a reg uh, a, a guideline to go off of mm -hmm. when you don't really know how to tell your own sensors uh from right or wrong or all those things is super helpful it's something i still use now um so yeah i, I definitely definitely agree on that and i also think that that's something that doesn't go away you made a good point that you know yes at the beginning you need that more but that's something i i say it's like it's like a little gnome that's sitting on your shoulder and is always going to be with you, you know? So if you're not aware of how things are going in your life and how you're eating and how your emotions are, you could, that's your default. Like when you're not paying attention, that could just take over. And before you know it, that's it. You know, you're in it. You can get out of it faster because you're in recovery and you know that you have the tools and you know how to, but it's really easy to fall back into it you know, and like, I have some clients now because of the pandemic, you know, I'm doing zoom sessions. And so I have some clients who are struggling because they're in their house, they're with their emotions and they're like, I don't have distractions. Now, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And we have to come up with a whole different way of them dealing with their emotions because they don't have as many distractions and they don't want to be using food as their distraction or a way to punish themselves either, right? Yeah. That cycle. So always being aware, like, are my feelings similar to how they were when I wasn't in a good place? 
you know, am I feeling out of control? Am I, what am I doing with my feelings? Yes. I think, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing I would say to be aware of because people think that eating issues are about food and food. It's not, it's about control. So when you feel out of control, you go for the food. So if you can learn how to deal with your emotions internally, you don't need to use the food as much. And, and I'm sure being a woman in the sport, all the stuff you mentioned, there's a lot of emotions you're feeling all the time. Right. And so you really have to be aware, right? So I have a question when it comes to that then. So how does, uh, because I kind of Googled like what like bulimia is and it, and I was saying it from, from a male's perspective is that that's kind of what competing is to some aspect. It's especially when you get to that high level start is where you, you have like a deadline you're trying to make weight. Like some of the guys I've trained with, you know, uh, uh, they they went to Korea. One of them had to lose because it was a uh, like it was a large payday for the for the competitor. He had to lose like something like thirty five pounds in like a short period of time. Yeah. So it's like they the, they do like a lot of like yo yo stuff in order for them to compete. And I, I'm I don't compete at that level, so I really don't know. Like how yeah. does, like how do how do how do how do they avoid like falling into this trap? You know what I mean? Like it's just yeah. like it feels like it's a you because the system is set up to kind of point you in this direction because I see again, a lot of the competitors also because we train a lot, the training is very high intensity training. And so you'll see that they will be very regimented with their food. And then there'll be like spurts where the guys, again, I'm not, not, again, I don't know about the women, but the guys, friends that I have, where you'll see them eating stuff that are like, dude, did you just have like a whole pizza, a pint of ice cream? And that was like on top of your normal food day that it's like, like I'm like I'm, the, I'm like I'm disgusted just like separating <laughs> you posting that on social media that I'm like Jesus, but then but then again it's like they, when you see I can only imagine what they feel when they see themselves in the mirror, you know. And again, I'm talking from a guy's perspective because a lot of the guys that are like that, you you see them and it's like the the their body fat is very low, they're very they're very in shape, they're 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 very good at jujitsu, so it's like. I'm worried about them because some of them are, you know, they're, they're Kendall's age where, you know, they're 22 years old, 20, 19 years old, 20, 20, 23. And, and it's a, not a problem so much now because you're still relatively young. It's, yeah. it's as you get older and eventually you're not going to be doing the sport at the competitive level forever. You got to be, something's going to have to change. So how do you, how do you avoid something like that? Um, I, I think we can both probably touch on this just with our different, our different areas of expertise. I know mm -hmm. For me, um, I mean, I could, I could literally talk about this topic for like five hours in a row, probably more because this is so, I mean, this is everything that I do all day, every day. Um, for me, it really started in high school. Um, and the high school wrestling environment is very, um, I don't, and I don't mean, I didn't say this with as much love as I can. They're very undereducated on what weight cutting does to the human body and not just to the body, but to the mind. And I knew a lot of men or boys, they were boys, like 13, 14, 15, 16, a lot of boys who are also practicing bulimia at the same time, which if mm -hmm. the listeners don't know is eating and throwing up your food um, and other things, anorexia, not starvation, uh, laxatives were huge, um, different things like that. So and then over exercising, sorry to interrupt oh, you, but I just oh. want to add over exercising is another way to practice bulimia and anorexia and purging because people will overeat and then they'll go over exercise and that's the same 100%. thing as throwing up. 100%. And you know what's funny in the wrestling world is if you tell wrestlers that they would laugh at you because they over exercise every day. You know what? I, like they eat and literally they're like, how many calories did I eat? Okay, um, I'm going to go on the elliptical until it says like X amount of calories were burned, just like you're talking about with eating disorders. Um, that's very, that's, that's completely normal. Completely normal. There are so many coaches who will tell you like, okay, what did you eat for dinner? You have to be X weight on Saturday. Okay. So now you need to go to the gym and burn, you know, 200 calories more than you ate because you have to be this weight on Saturday. And that's very, very normal, which is why I say wrestlers will laugh at that because they're like, um, yeah. And you know, so, so they're like over exercising, like they don't even, they don't even register that they're like, no, that's, that's my normal life. Um, which is very scary because like I, and again, I say this with so much love, but why do you think when you walk into a high school gymnasium at a wrestling tournament, all of the coaches are overweight? Why is that? 
because they all starve their way through their teens and early 20s. And now they mm -hmm. do not how to deal with emotional eating. And they're all overweight because they binge eat, And they, they still are helping all their athletes cut weight. And they're still in that world. But they don't have to make weight themselves. And they're not a competitor anymore. So they're just constantly eating. They don't know how to regulate any kind of food. Um, mm -hmm. any kind of eating disorder and they don't, then they're undereducated. It's super sad because they just don't know. They weren't, that was what they were taught. That's what they saw. Of course, that's what they're going to do. And even if they do feel like it's wrong, you know, now they're 40, 50, 30, 40, 50 years old. They've been doing this for uh, 30, 40 years and, or, you know, whatever, 20, 30 years. And they're like, um, okay, yeah. Like, what am I supposed to do now? And now I'm still telling my daughter to go lose 15 pounds this week. It's like, it's crazy. And so it really started for me in high school where my parents were super against it, by the way, because in jujitsu and judo, I always just competed what I weighed. And this is kind of getting back to your question, Hiro, of like, what do we do about this? For me, my solution, like my issue in wrestling was that the highest weight class for women was 165. I think it's 167 now, but that's the highest you can compete internationally and you can compete higher in college. But if you're trying to make the Olympics, all you care about is the international weight. So for me, I was walking around, you know, same as what I am now, maybe even higher if I would, I would like cut weight and yo-yo up higher. So I'd be like 190, um, 195, even if I was like having a crazy time um, and then have to get back down to 165. So I was constantly, you know, cutting down to make this weight and, and then bouncing back up because for me, like when I'm at, like I'm 180-ish or 185-ish right now, if I'm like 170, 175, I have a six pack, like I'm, I'm yoked, like I'm, that's just how my body is. So for me to get to 165 was not a natural way for me to walk around at. There's just no way I could, I could be there unless I intentionally lost a lot of muscle, um, which I didn't even really know how to do because you're working out 24 seven, right? So, so to kind of dive into what do we do from there, for me, the answer had to be leaving wrestling. And that was absolutely heartbreaking. I, I came back from college, like one of my, my worst horror stories ever was when I chopped off my hair because at the U S open, I was trying to make 165. I had been like 188 the, the Monday of the, the week of the tournament. So like the Monday I was like 188, I had to weigh in at 165 on like a Friday or Saturday, whatever it was. So you can imagine amount, the amounts of like, not just no food, but like dehydration and the torture chamber of the sauna and all that stuff and there's an awesome flow grappling documentary out right now about weight cutting that kind of goes into this um but i don't really even think they touch on how on how bad it is in jiu-jitsu and wrestling they kind of talk more mma but that's another story for another time and i got to the weigh-in arena I was like 0.1 kilos over um, and I went to the bathroom and I looked myself in the face. I'm actually going to look up this picture right now because you guys need to see my face, how hollowed out I was. But I uh, walked, I was in the bathroom and I looked myself in the eyes and I chopped off my hair. And it was one of those moments where I really, and I was very active in my eating disorder at the time. I had already been to some programs. So I had a lot of awareness around what I was doing, but had no idea how to stop. And I had moved countries and I was alone and all the rest. And I'd stopped going to program uh, recovery. And I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, I know exactly what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm willingly doing it because I'm chasing the Olympic dream. And I chopped off my hair and I made weight and I basically fell off the scale. Like it was ridiculous. Uh, my mom was there terrified trying to help me. Mm -hmm. I started like rehydrating after weigh-ins the way that I always did by the way like I always did a certain that's a huge rehydration is a huge thing and I did it the way I always did could not hold anything it all went straight out of my body like I didn't even feel it happening it was just like out and I had to go in the bathroom it was super embarrassing and I still cut weight a few times after that but it was that tournament and then the next day I just got trashed like absolutely trashed like lost to people I normally beat got beat up my body wouldn't do what I wanted. Like I literally looked down at my legs and I was like, move. And they wouldn't move. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that being said, I still competed a few times after that cutting weight, but I came home a few months later from college and my parents really wanted me to leave wrestling, but they knew better than the think that them telling me was going to force me. So instead, you know, they were excited for me to go back to recovery. They were um, really supportive of me trying jujitsu again. Um, and I fell back in love with jujitsu. I wasn't even up until maybe like a month before I was supposed to go. This is a summer. So a month before I was supposed to go back to the school that I think I finally whispered the words, like it was terrifying to me, but I finally whispered the words of like, I don't think I can go back to Vancouver. 
And what I really meant was, I don't think I'm going to wrestle anymore, but I couldn't even say that. Like that was not even like something I could fathom at the time. Cause my, I remember like my 18 year old self had this whole life built around the idea that in 2020, I was going to go to the Olympics and I had my whole life planned at 18, of course. And I assumed this was going to happen. So to even give that up was like unbelievable. So I said, I wasn't going to go back to Vancouver, started doing jujitsu full time. And then eventually, you know, kind of decided, like, I think I'm going to try to go hard in jiu-jitsu. I think I'm going to make this my life. And the reason why is because I can compete without a weight class. I can compete in the open weight, which is like 175 and above, um, which is what I compete at. And I can focus on my sport and having fun and not be beating myself up and killing my organs all the time. Um, So again, back to the question of how can we avoid this in my, my experience, I had to compete at the weight that I weighed all the time, no matter what, I could not try to control my weight because anytime, like during the summer, I would try to get healthy from bulimia and I would try to uh, just eat like normal foods. It would always creep back up like, okay, but I know in a few months, I'm going to have to be 165 again. I know in a few months, I'm going to have to do this again. So even if I, if my weight goes up now, I can't let it go up too high or I'm not going to be able to lose a 40 pounds in August or whatever it is. I'm going to have, I'm going to create more of a gap. So it was like always, I couldn't until I let it go and didn't have that be a concern at all and stopped weighing myself. That was the moment I could start to heal because having a goal, no matter how far out it was for me, was just not something I could cope with. So, so when I started competing jiu-jitsu and I can compete whatever weight I was and it didn't really matter and I could stop weighing myself, then the magic started to happen where I kind of just ate and, and gradually, and, and Margie knows obviously a lot about this, you know, the more I ate for my body and my activity and learned how to kind of have my sensors come back to life of when I'm hungry, when I'm full, things like that, when I need food, the more that started to happen, my, the, my weight balanced itself out because my brain was kind of, relearning and my body was relearning how to eat and as that happened uh after the weight went up it started to go back down because I you know learned to eat what I need to eat for my activity in my body and I wasn't doing so much emotional eating about you know eating over the fact that I was eating and being depressed about eating and eating more um and yeah so so it kind of gradually happened over time but so I've seen a lot of athletes around me move up in weight classes to avoid this issue um of making weight where they just kept moving up weight classes until like number one, they could heal as far as eating disorders, but even number two, for people who don't maybe have super serious eating disorders, but disordered eating or concern over making a weight class, they performed so much better in their training because they were properly fueled that it actually helped them succeed in a higher weight class, where instead of cutting down to be like the guy at the top and like to be the strongest guy or girl in the weight class, now they were a much more technical person and stronger person at the higher weight class because their training was fueled. Their training was, was, uh, had a lot more energy and intention behind it. They were going into the match healthy and fueled and their organs were lubricated and things like that. Um, and that's really what made a big difference. So, so, and I've definitely felt that myself. Um, I feel like a completely different person now competing, but not only competing, training. My training is much stronger because I'm not um, depriving myself of nutrients and water all the time. So I know that was a long answer, but I really wanted to dive into that because that is uh, the only way that I was able to heal was by giving up trying to make a weight class. The only way, even if you had told me my weight class was like 185 and I was like already 185, I would have gotten myself up to 195 out of anxiety. Like there's no way for me that I could have that and still, and still be healthy and survive. And I was, you know, on the verge of going to the hospital multiple times. There just, there was no way. Now other people may not be so extreme, maybe going up a weight class for them that still has like a cutoff is perfect. Cause they just needed a little wiggle room to relax. Maybe that's that, that's the case for a lot of people. I think, um, for me, I had to let it go and just see where I landed. And then and I landed right back where I started, but in a much healthier mind and body. Yeah. So I want to add to that. That was really awesome. I love that you are sharing this message Kendall with everybody and and helping everyone get more aligned with who they are and and that's what I basically want to say like in a nutshell of what you're saying that when you get aligned with who you are and food doesn't become the center of your universe which like you said it's hard because you're trained that way right and a lot of sports it's like this and so when you're aligned with yourself and you start to get aligned with food again and then you kind of dive into what feels good compared to like, what, what should I be doing based on my weight, right? 
and then you move up a weight class or whatever is the path for you, then I feel like you're doing things more intuitively rather than I have to do this or I should do this. And I feel like in life in general, not just eating disorders, when we come from an intuitive place, we just kind of are led to like what's next for us that is a fit for us and we blossom from that. And so I feel like from that, only good things are gonna come. Recovery is gonna come, success is gonna come. You're gonna get really great, even better, not great, but like even better than you've been at your sport, right? Right. So uh, I mean, you can tell me if you agree, but that's kind of my perception that I think when you are following instinctively what feels good. And, and a lot of times you don't know what feels good when you're in this place, right? So you have to start there and work on the emotional side and work on the food side at the same time. And so I think when you get balanced, then you kind of figure it out. But I think higher to answer your question, from my perspective, it's not like a specific thing, like do this and then you're going to avoid an eating disorder. I think it's really at the end of the day, alignment with, who am I? What do I want to do? What feels good? But also figuring out how to deal with your emotions in the middle of all this. Yeah, and Kendall, I, would you agree? Yeah, I do. Uh, 100%. And I hope you keep pushing this message, Kendall, because uh, I, th- I think it just needs to, like, the stigma just needs to change a little bit. Like, the norm it just needs to change. It's what getting it? a little bit better. Like, like yeah. one, of the, one, of the, one of the high-level brown belts that I train with that should – to be honest with you, you should already be a black belt, but he, for whatever reason, is not. Um, he, he's a young guy, and that was one of the things that he said. He's like, he's like, dude, I don't, I don't, I don't worry about cutting weight. He's like, whatever I walk around that is what I walk around that. He's like, I give myself like a, like a five to six pound cushion, where it's like if I'm close enough to that weight class, he's like, yeah, I'll put a little extra work in, whatever to kind of shed it off. He's like, but anything more than that, he's like, I'm not doing that. He's like, I. I've done it once or twice before, and it it, it, it just feels horrible. And yeah. and I, I hope that ev- that it kind of expands to where it, it changes like that. I, I I experienced the wrestling thing, but that's wrestling is like years and years, like decades they've been doing that, you know. And jujitsu is still a relatively young ingrained. sport. Say again. It's very ingrained, and and people don't really know much better. And and with jujitsu too, like. There's a lot of people, by the way, speaking about this, and it's fine. Like, uh, Big John McCarthy was in this Flow Grappling documentary along with uh, Mike Dolce, and they were talking about how bad it is in MMA, and, like, they get hit in the face, and their brains aren't properly hydrated. It's like there's no cushion left, and they get, like, these crazy concussions, and people have died, and it's and it's really scary. But I would argue, like, in jiu-jitsu, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I would argue, like, my elbow is probably a lot more likely to break in an arm bar if I'm not hydrated properly because, mm-hmm. like – in training, for example, I know kind of my limits of an arm bar and I know where I can keep escaping or if I need to tap, right? In a tournament, if I'm if I'm dehydrated and I think I'm normally supposed to be at a certain level, I may not know the level at which my arm is going to actually break. So I'm I would argue that that's that's a very real threat and that happens probably all the time um, with injuries in jujitsu. And with like with speaking about it, I think it, it's gonna take a lot of, you know, big big names to start making this change but it also is going to take the organizations making changes the reason why i think jujitsu is is very different in this area it's it's not nearly as extreme as wrestling and mma is because we weigh in right before we fight for most tournaments not all super fights and stuff but for most tournaments we weigh in right before we fight whereas with wrestling and mma you have a 24-hour window to recover which leads people to think that they are able to to cut extreme amounts of weight and i also want to make it clear like with your friend for example i'm not saying there's tons of there are tons of people especially men just because of the way that they shed water typically differently than than women and the amount of water they have in their body um and things like that and and different hormonal stuff i think there's tons of men who they sweat off five pounds in a training session like that's not a big deal like if they you know go to a tough training session to make a certain weight class that may not be classified as unhealthy for them you know but it's it's really individual and it's very personal i also know men who have really disordered eating patterns where if you put five pounds in front of them that's going to be extremely hard for them to do without triggering some other habits and same with women so so there are probably a lot of people who five pounds is not really a big deal once we start getting into like eight nine ten it's hard to argue that that's a healthy thing for for a human body to do in my opinion 100 percent. and you're absolutely right about the the joint when you're dehydrated uh less synovial fluid less elasticity at the tendon and ligament right. level 
So basically the normal stress that you're able to take when you're hydrated compared to when you're not hydrated is it's, it's substantial. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just basically more dangerous to be dehydrated if you're, if you're going to be competing at the high level. Right. Um, awesome. This, this, this is what you're, I see why Gary V liked you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, you're, you're, uh, I, I'm happy, happy to have the opportunity to share a little bit more of my story. I know, like, like I was telling you guys before the interview, I haven't talked too much about this publicly. I've talked a lot about body image and weight cutting and positivity, but haven't really like told a lot of like my uh, deep, dark like experiences or anything like that. And, and I hope that that people hearing it can kind of uh, either they relate to it or, or they have, you know, an experience where they're like, Oh wow. Like I didn't really know that it got that it gets that bad or, or things like that. And, or maybe, you know, some people that are younger, I wish I had been able to hear stories like this when I was starting out 13, 14, 15. Um, I don't know if it would have changed my, my trajectory because I was young and stubborn as many of us high level athletes are. Um, but at least I would have had a little bit of awareness about, you know, what I'm getting myself into and like, Oh wow. Other people do this too, because I had no idea, you know, for a long time. So, so what would you recommend? What, how would you like if you were talking to a young version of yourself right now from what you've been through, what what would you tell that 12, 13 year old like to be like to like approach the whole process? Like, what yeah, because like, there's a lot of because I feel like you're at the point now where one, I feel like you're 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 only going to go up from where you're at right now. So your fan base is only going to increase. And as your fan base increases, you're going to get a lot of, you know, very young girls, especially because the, 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 the female population in the sport is growing exponentially as well right. year after year. They're going to kind of look at you and what would you say to them saying, hey, you're starting this career or you're starting this path to be a competitor to how to handle the, the, the process when it comes to that? Yeah, man, it's, it's really tough because like I said, like, like young people that age are, especially athletes are super stubborn and, and very determined. And especially, you know, if you're having the kind of resilience, like it becomes like a competition almost. It's like, who's, you know, the strongest, who does the hardest weight cuts, who's the most impressive. Like it's, it's a whole toxic environment, but um, so, so it's hard, it's hard to pick one thing to say, but I, I think that like the, the practice, there's two things. There's like a practical advice part to it. And then there's like an emotional psychological part to it. The practical advice is just like, just fight what you weigh, just compete what you weigh, just whatever you weigh, compete there. Don't manipulate your weight for the tournament, go to the tournament, what you weigh and learn how to be dominant at that weight class or whatever that is. That's the practical advice. And don't listen to anyone who tells you otherwise, because um, they don't know what the long-term effects are going to be on your body and your mind. And you don't know either. Nobody knows. Um, and that's, that's a very scary thing because you don't know how just doing it. It's always one more time, right? It's always one more time. Then I'm going to stay at that weight. You don't know how doing it one more time is going to affect your life. So just compete what you weigh. Don't listen to anyone who tells you otherwise. It doesn't matter if a coach thinks you should fit into a certain weight class for the team points or whatever it is, don't do it. Um, because your team will get over it. And at the end of the line, it's your body and your life. So that's number one, the practical advice. Um, but number two, you know, the psychological, like emotional device, uh, advice is kind of the stuff that like Margie was touching on is just like, learn to get in tune, um, with your body and aligned with your body and eat what you need, um, or and what you want, you know, and, and I and as far as that goes, find people in your life that you can look up to that are positive examples of body positivity and, um, and normal eating, whatever normal is, uh, and things like that, because you may not have role models in your life that, that show that, you know, a lot of parents have, like a lot of people look up to their parents and their parents have disordered eatings or their coaches or their favorite athlete or things like that, that really seeps into like who they, how they view themselves. Like you have to find people that you look up to, um, that, that, that are showing these positive ways of eating and doing their body and just teaching you, uh, if you don't already, teaching you how to be a little bit kinder to yourself and really get aligned with yourself. And that's more of a psychological thing where I know it takes a longer period of time, but what I, what my favorite part about this is that this practical advice kind of 
feeds into the psychological aspect of it as well. And they both work together. And if you can do that and kind of put blinders on and ignore everybody who's telling you otherwise, you're going to end up a lot better off in the next few years. Um, you know, as you especially go throughout your teen years where bodies are changing and everything revolves around getting boys or girls to like you. And it's, it's, it's a big time of insecurity is like, the truth is that like none of that is worth sacrificing your health, your mind, your body um, for because you're you're stuck with the same one for the rest of your life. So how you treat it now is going to matter. You know, how you treat it now matters extremely uh, at an extremely high level. So so, yeah. So those are my two my two pieces. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Comes from a lot of painful experience. So if it can help somebody else, then I'm happy. <laughs> cool. Do we want to add anything else, Marge? Um, I want to add that a lot of times people don't realize that eating disorders start at six or seven years old because that's when your mindset is already starting to be geared toward that, meaning your belief system is already getting affected. You're already starting to think, I guess this is what I want people to watch out for or people that have children um, keep an eye on this when a six or seven year old starts to say I'm fat or something about their body and they start to complain that's not really normal for kids to do kids are supposed to be kids and just play and have a good time and evolve and develop so when children start at that age already you know squeezing the fat on their body and starting to point out the things that they think are making them feel ugly. I think parents should give that attention and not ignore that and think, oh, that's no big deal. Because from my perspective, when someone says, hey, this isn't okay with me, but you need to give that attention. So it starts from my experience, six or seven years old. And when I talk to people who come in, let's say at 30 years old, and I'll say, when did you start feeling like this? It's always six or seven, maybe even five. Um, so I agree with Kendall, with the people around them, you know, a lot of times the parents have the eating disorders that haven't been dealt with. And um, so when kids are starting to talk like that and look at themselves like that, pay attention. And then that just escalates and it just gets more and more and more. And then it starts to usually show up in like middle school, um, yeah. sixth, seventh, eighth grade, starting to maybe withhold food or overeat or you know just like little behaviors start to show up um it may start to become a problem at that point but it doesn't really start to rear its ugly head until like eighth grade i'd say maybe ninth like 14 15 16 you know sometimes people will say to me oh i went to college i was great and then i woke up one day and i had an eating disorder <laughs> That doesn't happen. You don't wake up with an eating disorder. It's been evolving all this time. So the sooner you can catch it, the more you can get ahead of it. And you know, the more you can start to dive in there before it escalates and gets bigger and bigger. So it really does start with your belief system and your emotions. And so in the same way, if you can dive into that and start to heal your belief system, start to heal traumas from the past that have affected that, start to take care of your emotions and the food at the same time. That's why it's great to work with a therapist and a nutritionist if you can. Um, then you can really start to get aligned. So I just want people to know that this starts really young because usually by the time they're paying attention is when they're in crisis. And you can always do so much more work staying ahead of the crisis than waiting for the explosion to happen. Right. One, one thing that you just inspired me to add, Marge, is I, because I totally, I, I really understand, I really understand and appreciate what you're saying is uh, one of the biggest things like for me is, as I, as I remember looking back to that age and, and seeing how I felt and um, I definitely had, you know, definitely started feeling things like in fifth, sixth grade. Before that, I was actually like super hyper confident as a kid. I'd be like, oh, like I'm super strong. I'm in shape. Like I would talk about this stuff all the time. Like one time my dad was like, you're going to eat like another, like not in a mean way, just, you know, he was like, you're going to eat another cake or whatever it was. And I was like, you see this? Like I'm, I'm buff. Like there's like a, a <laughs> fond memory he has. Like and I was really super hyper confident. Um, and I had really, really great parenting and, and I was very lucky in that department. I really blessed in that department. Um, but in, in middle school and high school or middle school or 
fifth, sixth grade, it really started kicking in. And I think one of the biggest things was uh, learning these thought process from other people, hearing people talk about dieting, hearing people talk about how much they hated their body. And then I started to look at myself and be like, oh, does that apply to me too? And mm -hmm. one of the best things I ever did um, was stop talking about my body in front of my sister. And my sister's two and a half years younger than I am. And I noticed, you know, as a teenager, I was talking about, I was like, oh, I'm so fat. I don't like how I look. And then as I started to get some recovery under my belt, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, I made a really conscious decision not to talk about that at all in front of my sister and whether I felt it or not, um, because I noticed she was starting to copy me and mm -hmm. I noticed she was starting to say the same things. And I'm sure this happens all the time with, with moms, dads, with parents, uh, where the kids learn the, that kind of talk and behavior. Um, and so for me, another thing I just want to put out in the universe is like, if you have younger people or not, or older people, whatever, if you have people who are looking to you or people you're spending a lot of time with, even friends, because obviously a lot of this is learned from friends as well, like different ways to control your weight. Um, be very, very careful about the way you talk about yourself in front of them, because it brings attention to their own insecurities as well and to the way that they think like, oh, wow, like I never even thought about my stomach looking like that. Does mine look like that too? Because I thought she looked great. If she's, she's, you know, 110 pounds. If she thinks she's fat, then what does that make me? Like that very classic, you know, thing. And at the time I was in really good shape. Like I was in incredible shape, but I was so insecure. So then you have my younger sister looking to me like, wait, my sister's a professional athlete. Like, how am I supposed to feel about my body? And then she started saying the same things. And I think that is extremely powerful. And, and she and I have had conversation about this since then of how me stopping saying those things and me talking very, very positively about my body at all times within my house and within, you know, my family um, really started to allow her to change the way she thought about herself as well. So it works both ways. That's, that's the great part. It works both ways. It can, it can be positive and negative. Um, so that's one thing that if, if, if you got anything from listening to this, that's one very, very small thing that not only can help the people around you, but it also rewires the way that we talk to ourselves. It's a practice, right? So that's huge uh, for me. That's such a good point. Um, and, you know, I remember there's somebody in my family, I won't mention who, who <laughs> um, when she was little, she started to adopt something from her mom like that because her mom started to point out all the things that were wrong with her. And so I noticed at like five years old, she was starting to say she was fat. And I thought, oh my God. And it, I think being aware of that is such an important thing. And I have three girls. So I was so aware on the days that I didn't feel so hot, not to say, oh, I feel yucky today, or I feel ugly. Just mm -hmm. like, don't say the negative stuff, you know? And, I, and just being aware of that, you're so right, would shift that in me and would shift that, and they saw themselves differently, you know? So I think that's a really great, good point. And I don't wanna say that everyone that experiences eating disorders or disordered eating has parents that have that or have bad parenting. That's not always how it is. <laughs> um, sometimes it's like that, but also we can get messages from everywhere, right? We can get messages from the media, especially women get a lot of pressure on how they look. Um, we can get messages from our peers in school. And like you said, you could be going along and everything's great. And all of a sudden someone says something about themselves and you're like, wait, and yeah. you know, we can get it from everywhere. So it's, it's important to just be aware. So if you have people around you that are younger people, like sisters, brothers, just being aware of what you're saying and how you're showing up and how you're affecting them and also paying attention to your own emotions and where are you at? Because it's really about that, right? At the end of the day, like how do you deal with your emotions and where do they go? Because we all feel our stuff. It's not always great. I don't care how evolved you are. It's just like, what are you gonna do with it? Yeah, 100%. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you, made, you definitely made me a fan. You're gonna you're gonna give me for promoting you a little bit every once in a while. Thank you, thank uh, you. We're, we're obviously cool. passionate people here, so it's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's listen. I mean, you, you guys are obviously talking about uh, how you feel about food, but I I just think the the things that you guys are talking about, I just think applies just to your own confidence. Just period. How you you vocalize is is basically how you're talking to yourself. The way you vocalize is that conversation that you're having in your head. And it could be for like competition. It could be for work. It could be for food. It could be everything. So you have to be 
like self-aware of how you talk to yourself. Because if you start talking like outwards, it just reinforces that dialogue that you have in your, in your own mind. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't apply. I mean, even though we are talking about, you know, food and, and diet and things like that, but I just think it applies to, to everything. You know, if you want to be the, the better version of yourself, you got to change the, the conversation you have with yourself in order for you to keep kind of moving forward. Cool. All right, guys. So, how do Kendall, what's your, where, where's the best way to reach you? <laughs> um, you can reach me anywhere at Kendall Roosing, but as we discussed on like Gary, Gary V, it's, it's uh, spelled like reusing. So, it's Kendall, K E N D A L L, reusing. Um, and that's like, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, everywhere. And then obviously, yeah, so you can find me there. And I'm also really glad to be here because I'm pretty sure I'm going to be starting a podcast in the next few weeks, um, which, uh, so if you guys uh, are listening to this later on and it started, you guys can also search Kendall Roosing and find me, find me there. Awesome. And Mar Margie, you're, tell me, you're on the internet? So uh, my website is growandheal.com, all spelled out, G-R-O-W-A-N-D-H-E-A-L. And you can just email me directly, Margie, M-A-R-G-I-E, at growandheal.com. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on <laughs> social media. So <laughs> social probably media. probably the good. best way to reach me is just directly like that. Yeah, don't worry about it. All right, guys. So obviously subscribe if you if this is the first time uh watching it share this uh especially if you know anybody that that you think may have some type of uh need some help um you can always reach out to margie you can reach out to kendall uh at any point we're, we're all here to basically help you that's kind of why we're doing this um below you're going to get all of our contact information and share this with it you know with the world and with anybody that you think that might benefit from this Who's guys mm -hmm.